Welcome to TMI, a podcast by Henry Ford Allegiance Health. And today, this is a, what is this, like an outdoor edition, even though we are inside. Yeah, the fall weather's coming. Getting cold, leaves are changing, it's a little wet outside. Yep. Makes me want to bundle up and go for a little hike. Yeah, or have some bonfires, be outside, just enjoy the great outdoors, you know, leaves changing, go for walks. Yeah. Check all that stuff out. So, and... And also for some people, it's uh, hunting season as well. That's right. So that's why we're talking today, Dave. Yeah. And being someone who spends time outside, like going for those fall hikes and stuff. And I know there's a ton of ton more people out in the woods this time of year doing a bunch of different things. So hunting, safety, that's today's topics today. Who are we talking with today? Um, today we have our guest, Alan Lazara, MD. He's a emergency room doctor here at Allegiance Health. Welcome, Dr. Lazara. Thanks for having me, Tim. Appreciate it. Yeah. So... Like we mentioned, you know, people are out and about walking, doing things. Um, we know you're a hunter. Mm-hmm. You've been doing some studies too recently about all injuries hunting related. So um, we'll kind of just jump right into it and mm-hmm. and kind of, you mentioned we were kind of talking a little bit before this about a study you've been kind of doing about hunting injuries. Can you kind of talk about that? Like what you were looking for or what the study's about? Yeah, sure. So um, at Henry Ford Allegiance, we have uh, a, a residency program. And part of having that residency program is maintaining uh, research coming out of the institution. And so with uh, three other of my uh, fellow colleagues, three residents, we looked at some data from 2015 to 2019 on tree stand related injuries. So it's injuries that uh, occur when a hunter is up in a tree and falls out or um you know, there are other injuries that can happen when you're putting up the stand, but predominantly it was yeah. falls. And so we looked at our trauma database. We looked at Epic and um, kind of dove in and, and, and found all these cases. And we ended up finding about 33 cases over five years. And we would just characterize like what was happening and, and what the uh, what the situation was, how the person fell, what kind of injuries they had. And so we found that, uh, as expected, there were a, a fair number of serious injuries and mm-hmm. about 30% of them were spinal fractures, spinal column, like oh. lumbar spine or thoracic spine yeah. fractures. So those are, you know, it, not all of them resulted in spinal cord injury or paralysis. Uh, there was only one case where that happened, but nonetheless, a lot of those uh, guys, predominantly men, were falling Um are probably going to have chronic back pain and yeah. a lot of them needed surgery. Um, but our focus was on characterizing the types of falls uh, and the types of injuries that uh, people sustained. Was that in our region here? Or was yeah. That- oh, yeah. It was just Jackson County. Oh, wow. or, well, it was people that presented to Henry Ford yeah. Allegiance. So presumptively, because we're a county hospital, it was all of, mm-hmm. you know, people falling in Jackson County. Now, yeah. I mean, there's a sampling um issue because you know not all tree stand falls present to the er or they Mm -hmm. they might go to hillsdale or they could go to u of m or uh, uh, or chelsea but um predominantly you know it's a pretty good we have a pretty good catchment because there's not a lot of hospitals yeah close by not a lot of other trauma centers like hillsdale's not chelsea's not so yep um but yeah really serious injuries we had everything from you know long bone fractures to you know pelvic injuries and wow. really serious stuff when these people are falling from you know anywhere from 25 to 15 feet off the ground it's like kind of getting hit by a car yeah. when you hit the ground mm-hmm. so yeah. yeah i mean 33 doesn't sound when you mentioned that it doesn't sound like a giant number but the severities i mean that's those some of those are lifetime impacts that yeah. people are dealing with yeah for sure and and also you know if you're talking about the amount of cost to the person you know lost work days but also cost the healthcare system and something that's a really preventable injury so the way these injuries are prevented and it was all in an effort to publicize the the idea that people should be wearing just like they wear their seatbelt when they're driving in the car, they should be wearing a, a safety harness when they're hunting from an elevated stand. Yeah. Um, there's lots of different types of stands, but every one of them you should be wearing a, a, a full body safety harness. Um, and so sp- spun off of that, we uh, I got a grant from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services for some money and we put up some billboards. Tim, you're involved with that yeah. and mm-hmm. uh, created an ad campaign to publicize that. So Trying to um, bring awareness to that. Yeah. And, and so hopefully it's, you know, mom, girlfriend, son, or the person <laughs> themselves seeing that and yeah. saying, do you wear a harness? And they, you know, there's a lot of really smart people that don't wear it. Uh, and it's, it's unfortunate. Or they've been hunting for so long. They're like, I've been fine for yeah. 10 years, mm-hmm. 15 yeah. years. I imagine, you know, with anything you get older, yeah, things change. 
Like yeah. you, you're not as you're not as agile or as you used to be, and for sure you weigh more. Or, or your tree stand's now twenty years old and you haven't checked it, and yeah. it's raw. I mean, yeah. I guess kind of go through that too. I mean, because you know you talked about the injury side of it, but there's some things they're they're totally preventable. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's some things that people can do when they're going out hunting to kind of just safety measures. Like what what are some common sense things? Yeah, there's uh, in particularly uh, in regards to tree stand. Um, Injury prevention, you know, always wearing the, the harness, clipping in when you at, whenever you leave the ground because you have a safety line going up the tree, clipping into your ladder as you're going up, um, making sure that you're climbing uh, hands-free and using three points of contact, so two hands, one foot, two feet, one hand as yep. you're going up and not having, like, your gun over your shoulder or your mm-hmm. bow in your other hand. So using a haul line to bring your um, your weapon up with you, making sure that it's unloaded. That's a, that's a big <laughs> gun safety thing. You yeah, know, it's... Yeah. Uh, it's shocking, you know. We we all, uh, as hunters, go through hunter safety, but I think people over time. I mean, that's a one time class that you take once in your life, and if right. you don't have good modeling, then um, you might not always perform those uh, safety measures. Not drinking alcohol or using drugs. You know, people yep. think that most of the the general perception is that. Hunters are injured by firearms, and they're usually drunk when it's happening. Deer camp, right? Yeah. That's the old deer camp story. Yeah. They're going to and, deer camp, and they're all drinking, and guns are around. And- <laughs> yeah, and certainly there there is that uh, that version of deer camp, but there's also many other different kinds of camps where hunting, They there's people that popularize the idea that hunting, you can be an outdoor athlete where you're hiking up to high altitude or you're hiking into the back country yeah. or you're even hiking into Waterloo state rec area. I mean, if you drag a deer out of there, that's an, a very exertive process. Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it doesn't have to be the, you know, everybody's sitting around drinking, but on that, in our study, as well as the other studies I read on the topic, it's only around like three to 8% of the falls there's alcohol involved. So it's, hmm. it's not just drunk people falling out of trees. Um, and also, one of the other things that I think is really important to uh, to let people know is that tree stand falls occur about uh, two to three times the rate of uh, hunting firearm injuries. Uh, so mm-hmm. it's about 1.5 per 10,000 hunters get injured by a firearm. And for tree stand falls, it's between four and six per 10,000. So oh. it's two to three times as high, but most people don't know that. Um, Do you most- think, I mean, I guess it's a kind of psychological thing to me. Is it because, you know, obviously people know guns are dangerous. They're sure. like, okay, we got to be very careful with the firearm. You know, we mm-hmm. have live ammunition, whatever. I'm just climbing a ladder. You yeah. Know, I mean, is it, is it, do you think it's that perception possibly that people just aren't as. Yeah. I, I think that, um, I mean, tree stands definitely aren't new, but it's been much more popular in the last 20 to 25 years. Um, so it's a, a newer entity. Uh, number one, number two, um, I think it's kind of like my, my grandfather doesn't wear a seatbelt as often as I do because mm-hmm. I wear it every time and he wears it maybe 50% of the time. <laughs> yep. and, and so it's kind of a generational thing, I think. Um, and then, you know, I don't think in general hunters perceive the, the height as, as much of a threat as the firearm for sure. Yeah. Um, gravity is pretty rough. Yeah. Gravity can, as an ER doctor, I can tell <laughs> you that gravity gets a lot of people yeah. and, um, and it's something like when you're climbing up there, you don't do that like every day to climb up a 20 foot ladder and sit mm-hmm. on a little seat. Yeah, That's for sure. Like, yeah, you have to remember <laughs> this yeah. isn't something I do every day. And people predominantly fall like the the narratives that we would get. People predominantly fall when they're climbing up or down, not mm-hmm. when they're they're not like falling asleep in the stand and falling out. It's right. you generally when you're going up or down. Somebody slips or something and you think oh, the harnesses are breaking or the ladders are breaking. No, it's just it's somebody slips and they fall. Um, and you know, generally whatever hits the ground is going to get hurt and, uh, people usually don't fall on their head, but, and say like, well, I'm only going to be up 10 feet or 12 feet. But if you fall 10 feet onto your head, you're going to get seriously hurt. You know, it doesn't matter how high you are really, you know, anything greater than your own height. Usually, I mean, people fall from standing and trip have trip and fall, trip and fall and they have brain bleeds. You know, it's, uh, we didn't see many of those, but. Like I said, predominantly back and lower extremity fractures. Hmm. So there's, you know, there's the there's the safety aspect, making sure all your harness and your ladder and everything is good too. Mm-hmm. Is there any other things? I guess generally speaking, because I know like firearm season's coming up, mm-hmm. um, muzzle loader. This, you know, hunting season for Michigan mm-hmm. several months. Yes. Like are there other common sense things that people can think about doing when they're hunting? I mean, 
Yeah. Any, anytime you go out into the woods, I think whether you're hiking or you're going hunting, you should let somebody know where you're going to be, when you're going to return, um, carrying a signaling device with you. Something as rudimentary as a whistle, I think is great to throw in your backpack, but also make sure you have a, a cell phone. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going hunting, I've, I've found that, you know, no matter how good the cell phone is, the cold still affects the battery yep. life. So I always carry an extra battery with me just in case. Mm-hmm. Um, like one of those old charge portable batteries. Yeah. Uh, so those are those are good tips for everybody, I think. And you know, in, in terms of like the tree stand, like clearing out the area around your tree stand so there's not sharp sticks and big big rocks mm-hmm. that you can fall on. Yep. Um, are there things you can do to your tree stand to make it a little more safer for you to climb? I think every year you should. I, I mean, every season you should check your stand. They don't recommend using treehouse type wood and nail yeah, yeah. into the trees anymore because those rot over time. Yep. Uh-huh. Well, I think that's actually that's my happened. My father in law is you know he was going out to go to the tree stand and brother in law said it's out in the woods. It's over here, mm-hmm. and there was an old one mm-hmm. that he uh, didn't realize he meant the other one, not oh. the old one, and. Sure enough, the wood rotted, right that's, and he was fortunate enough to be able to to hug the tree. Oh wow! <laughs> and I mean, his arms were tore up, and you know, yeah. his hands were tore up because he was basically yeah. hanging from the tree and like shuffling, sliding down yeah. a tree. Ooh, it's pretty but, humbling. Yeah, not and, not a fun process. Yeah, and come, yeah, I said, come to find out, it was the wrong tree stand. Yeah, you know, so and things so, like that happen. Yeah, so for like our research study, we know that there's a lot more people that are falling just than just 33 over five years. Yeah. Uh, it works out about six per year. But um, when I started doing my research, it was, it was kind of like a two-year project that I started during COVID to keep my mind um, off other things. And um, there's a uh, National Electronic Injury Surveillance System, NEISS, run by the Consumer Product Safety Commission, which is a government agency. They're like the people that when you go to Meyer and you see the the baby seat that's yes, recalled or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Or it's always the baby stuff is recalled, you know, it's right. like, or a blender that's going to stab you. Yep. Um, so like uh, going on that website, you can find out how many people were injured by like avocados every year or by oh, wow. vacuums, you know, surprisingly avocados probably need a warning label because about 25 people per day go to the ER because they stab themselves in the, in the they're nation. Hard yeah. They're, hard, could, to, they're yeah. hard to cut open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the injuries, <laughs> it just doesn't make yeah. sense to me. But <laughs> but anyway, so you can search tree stand related injuries um, or tree stand um, uh, injuries in that database. And so they think, you know, the trend line's going down over the last uh, two decades, but it's also tempered by the fact that we've had a drop in hunter numbers nationally mm-hmm. over that last uh, 20 years. So we've lost about 2 million hunters per year and the tree stand falls have gone from kind of their peak, like 6,000 per year, now down to like 3,500 or 4,000 in uh, 2020 or 2019. But that's still 3,500 people that are yeah. falling every year. Um, not all of them are super injured, but those are just the ones that are presenting to the ER, like your father-in-law, yeah. father, father-in-law? Father-in-law. He just, yeah. yeah, he wouldn't have gone. He, he wouldn't have, have gone, right? Nope. Yeah. But he is very, you know... Um, yeah, guys don't like to let everybody know when they hurt themselves. Yeah, <laughs> or when they, were, they weren't thinking, or in yeah. his case, yeah. it was you know he wasn't not thinking; he just went to the wrong one. But like, mm-hmm. you know, if you weren't using what you're doing, what you're supposed to be doing, using common sense, mm-hmm. you're yeah. embarrassed. You're like, okay, well, that was a close one. Take yeah. a deep breath. All yeah. Right. Well, I'm glad he really didn't get that hurt. And yeah, um, mm-hmm. but we know those numbers are way underestimates, yeah. probably, of people that are actually getting hurt. So um, I look at it a lot like. A seat belt, you know, or a bicycle helmet, you know, not cool. Bicycle helmets were not cool when I was growing up, but I've got all my kids wearing them. I wear one and I wear my seatbelt all the time. And I think doing things that are smart, risky are okay. You know, if you're climbing a stand to, you know, enjoy the outdoors and uh, be an effective hunter, then I think that's a really fun activity, but just minimize your risk. Um, yep. So, yeah. And I know, I was looking up at some data too, and I, I know that like, like you mentioned, the hunting hunters in general, the rate's been going down. Mm. But I also noticed like the licenses went up last year, the pandemic. Apparently, yeah. I'm assuming that people were like, "Let's go outside. We can go do that." Yeah, that's last really fall. been. And yeah, so, that's really been a wonderful thing. Um, the uh, like numbers for like turkey harvests and uh, you know uh, deer tag sales have gone up tremendously, which is really heartening. I think because like you know, people can only spend so much time inside before yep. they lose their mind. And, and <laughs> this is a, I think a wonderful activity. Something that's really interesting that I also think a lot of people don't know. Um, and I didn't even know this cause I, 
I was kind of more of an adult onset hunter. Like I got brought up in a family that did go hunting early on, but then I wrestled in high school and college and that's prime time deer season. And so we were doing that. And, but I got back into it in medical school and, um, started listening to some, some podcasts and, and learned that the, the hunters, hunters that, you know, buy a tag, uh, or buy a license, um, or, you know, fishermen that buy gas at the dock or whatever for their boat, there's an excise tax on all that stuff and mm-hmm. all that. It's like a 10% excise tax on firearms and bows and ammunition that's already paid by the manufacturer. Um, and then couple that with the hunter license fees and tags, all that money gets rolled into, uh, funds that go back to the state. Um, some of it in a circuitous way through the federal government, through, um, uh, the Pittman Robertson Act. So there's this big coffer where those excise taxes go. And then the states have to qualify for that money by saying, we've used all of our, uh, DNR license sales and tags. We've yep. used that all in-house for research projects or habitat improvement or mm. parking lots for, you know, water, the state rec area, boat ramps. So we took all that money. We didn't use it for like the school system or the highway or whatever. Here's all the receipts or whatever. I don't know all the ins and outs, but here's <laughs> yeah. all the the money we spent. Yep. And they, then the, the government will say, okay, uh, based off of your land mass, how much surface area you have, how many people you have, here's a huge chunk of money from all that excise tax from the firearm sales across the nation. Um, and so all that money then gets used for creating uh, habitat for animals, gun ranges, things like that, funding hunter safety classes. And so it's kind of the self-perpetuating hunters are funding mm-hmm. these outdoor access points. And, and really what we need is you know, if, and I love, it's kind of strange to say, it, but like, I love animals. Um, I love yeah. deer. I love squirrels and rabbits and turkeys and all that stuff. Um, but somebody might say, well, you know, how can you love them and, and shoot them? Hunting. <laughs> but um, when you look at it from a biological perspective, you know, there's a certain carrying capacity population that uh, a state or a, an area can sustain. And so mm-hmm. if there's too many deer, they're going to end up eating themselves out of house and home or, getting hit by cars cars that's what i was thinking of too when they're yeah. not getting hunted huge number the car accidents go up and the number of deer being hit by vehicle sure. goes up it's a huge number it's in the millions every year of, mm-hmm. of car accidents that occur because of deer and so so getting back to that that money gets sent back to the state and so they use that money to create more habitat so in reality hunters are funding the the spaces and the propagation of and, and making sure that that animals have a place to be Yes, and so, um, and not not to point fingers or say anything bad, but people that shop at REI aren't buying backpacks and going camping. They're not paying that tax. You know, they yeah. love the outdoor space, but there's been this idea that we should have a backpack tax. You know, and somebody that buys a tent should pay a tax to the state so that mm-hmm. that money can be then for the you know, same parks I mean, for the same yeah. parks yeah to 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 keep the state parks open and stuff and so or it, like a license for mountain biking or something like that for sure because yeah you're yeah. ripping up the trail and like mm-hmm. that trail requires improvement and so yep. um it's a really it's a really wonderful tight system that was created back in the 1930s with the Pittman robertson act and then in the 1960s with the dingle johnson act for the boating um and so yeah it's it's an amazing i I struggle at times with politics and, and whatnot. I think yeah. a lot of us do, but this system works really well. And so this model is um, part of the North American uh, wildlife model and and it's envied all over the world. So, well, in Michigan too, we benefit from that because there we have so many state parks. We have mm-hmm. so many locations yeah. that, you know, conservation efforts, keeping things natural. I mean, mm-hmm. a, a, any, any county you go to, you're going to see a state yeah. park. You're going to see a lake, some, yeah. you know, some campgrounds. Some of the areas, trails. Yeah, it would be it would be great to have more and more of that because I think COVID really helped us realize, or at least me, how much those spaces are really treasured because you know it's our time to it's our time to be in those spaces and we need to make sure that they're there for our kids, mm-hmm. you know, and then their kids. So um, you know, funding that I think is really important. And so that's what you're saying. The licenses, yes. Other uh, firearm sales. Go so to I that. think a lot of a lot of people don't understand the the flow of the money, and when it comes to, um, you know, hunting is not just about killing something. It's about, you know, food for your family. It's about conservation. It's it's hand in hand. Yeah. Um, and then ironically too, a lot of that money comes from people that just like to shoot 
guns and go to the gun range. Mm -hmm. And so, cause there's an excise tax on all that ammunition. Like yep. I might use five slugs per year. That's yeah, it because hunting, I yeah. shoot three of them, four of them to target practice. And then I got one for the deer that I kill if I'm lucky. And then, I mean, that's a, not a large amount of uh, money that goes into that pot, but somebody that goes to the range and fires up a hundred rounds. I mean, they're paying, they're paying for those state parks. So <laughs> sidebar, but yep. interesting, no, I think. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. It kind of brings it full circle too, because I imagine some of that comes back to that funding for grants, like you were mm -hmm. applying for yes. to kind of improve yep. the safety side of it, to kind of awareness, yeah. like, you know, when you're using a tree stand, you know, this yeah. is, it's it's all kind of cyclical. Yeah, I really, I was not, um, so I, I went to University of Michigan for residency and that's a, a, a pretty academic place. And I got really... Um, I got really lucky to get in there. Let's just say that. I, I, ironically, I talked to the program director about hunting during my interview because he was a big deer hunter. He, he ended up being the president of uh, the American Board of Emergency Medicine, ABEM. And so I think that's kind of why I got into that program. But I wasn't really turned on by uh, research. So I, I spent time doing, you have to do some sort of academic pursuit to get through residency. And so I would help put on these continuing medical education courses and they were wilderness medicine education where we bring paramedics, nurses, residents, and teach them how to, you know, splint thing, splint extremities in the wilderness or how to treat hypothermia or mm -hmm. different topics like that, mushrooms, toxicity, things like that. And so I never really had much of a research bend. And then I think I really fell into the topic of tree stand falls. And it's, it's been wonderful because it's kind of a blend between my love of emergency medicine and then also my avocation of hunting and then also this idea of like a community service or a way to to help people beyond because like, things like this too like podcasts and media can be very powerful to help you don't know who's going to listen to this they might be like ah, i should probably wear a, a harness this year and then they don't break their pelvis you know right. yes which is amazing yeah it's or they or it catches them yeah we never hear about it we never know we never about know it. about it you yeah. know, their wife might hear about it and yeah. <laughs> she's the one that benefits because yeah. he's still here. Exactly. Or, exactly. So, 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 um, I think that that, that blend of medicine and, and media and, um, and hunting is, is really great. So with that money that came from the department of health and human services, I plan to go back like next year. I, I'd like to do, uh, I'll just have you say it now, Tim, that you're going to agree to do this. <laughs> that we're going to do a billboard campaign for gun safety in your home, you know, yeah. and I'm, uh, I'm a firearm owner and they're wonderful, but very dangerous tools. And, um, but you know, I've got kids and I'm very strict about it's in the safe. The ammo is locked up elsewhere. And yes. I think that hmm. the, the number of times that actually, when we actually have a, uh, an errant discharge or somebody gets hurt is, is very small, but it's super tragic. It's, yeah. it's awful. So I think that we can, we can come up with a campaign that's, you know, in the middle and not uh, not political because it, you know, I don't think it should be. It's about safety. Period. Yep. There's nothing political about safety in my mind when it comes to that. Yep. So um, a little bit off topic. Yes. Kind of random question. So mm. sort of not random. Not completely random. Any unique hunts? I guess you've been on. You know that, that maybe have been challenging. You know, just to you physically, mentally, anything. Or, and then also another sidebar question is. I imagine you've been around Jackson County outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. What's kind of your favorite parks or places to go? Um, my favorite by far is Portage Lake. I think that that place is yeah. um, in Waterloo State Rec area. It's uh, it's a hidden gem, I think, because the water is really warm and there's like a nice walk in. I got a, a four year old daughter who can just wade out 20 feet into the water and just and my kids are all young and, and they love it and go for a picnic there and. Uh, you can do stand up paddle boarding, which I used to think was kind of cheesy, but it's actually really awesome. <laughs> so, yep. uh, so I think that's my favorite space. Um, and then the whole Waterloo State Rec area is, I think, about three thousand square, three thousand acres or so. It's pretty big. Yeah, and it's it's all kind of smushed up and 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 spread out and mm -hmm. and not totally contiguous. Um, but I mean, that place is the most accessible, and so that's the place where I go the most. Um, but I have really. I haven't really been on a lot of, um, I've been on some fishing trips to Canada with my, my brother and my dad, and those have been wonderful. Um, and we've been to Montana fishing, but, uh, as far as like, uh, exotic 
hunts? Not really. I mean, I've, yeah. I just started turkey hunting like two years ago, haven't killed a turkey yet, but one of my favorite things to do is go squirrel hunting and because it's ex- extremely challenging because they're, they have a head the size of a quarter <laughs> And they're fast. They're they're really fast. And so, but you get to like, just, just get, it's like hiking or walking with a purpose, I think. And, you know, people may think it's weird to eat squirrel, but it, I'm telling, I'm telling you that it tastes like dark meat chicken if you cook it right. And sorry, you're, you're talking to a vegetarian over here. Oh, really? So I'm going to out yeah. you, Dave. I'm so sorry. I've been a little quiet. That's all right. Okay. I like vegetables too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And it, you know, the funny thing is I remember back in college, my buddy, I remember opened the freezer one time bunch of squirrel yeah in the freezer <laughs> in college yeah. i was like oh okay so he's he's yeah. and it's, it's not completely unfamiliar to me yeah they say it's the thinking man's chicken because it's essentially free mm. you know yeah and there's a lot of them <laughs> there are a lot of them yeah <laughs> but uh yeah so no real exotic hunts but i and i don't really need that now i'm because of my job because of how young my family is i'm um really pressed for time in a lot of ways and so mm-hmm. accessibility and being nearby and just being with my family and friends and, and being outside is, is the real, I mean, I don't need exotic. I'm a yep. pretty, mm, uh, easily pleased kind of person in that regard. <laughs> That's fine. But someday I'm going to go, I'd like to go, uh, antelope hunting in Wyoming. Cause that's cool. Cause you shoot them from far away and uh, I hear that meat's really good. And then like mule deer hunting in Colorado or Montana at some point, I don't know when that'll be, but Maybe when the kids are a little older. And- yeah, for sure. I'd love to get them into it because I think there's there's so many things. Like it's such a wonderful thing to do. Even if you just go mushroom hunting, you know what I mean? There's so mm-hmm. many things that you can do when it comes to, you don't have to shoot the mushrooms. You just you just pick them. Yep. Um, but like, you know, you get to teach them about being uncomfortable in a space that's not the same as they're always used to and learning how to deal with, uh, you know, conditions that are not quite ideal, um, sleeping on the ground and, appreciating a warm shower afterwards and oh, yeah. and also too you get to see things i mean you get to see the stars you get to see animals you get to see things in a in a way that you just can't get from the side of the road or the sidewalk and um it's very humbling i think to be out there and so yeah, yeah. i'd love to get that instilled in my children It'd be awesome so yeah and i do know you mentioned like the, the night sky i know i think it's hudson has a di- yeah. dark sky designation mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. their state park down yeah. there so cool Which and is, that's 20 minutes away from us again. And that's, yeah, that's super close. I looked into that. There's, I think there's like six of them in Michigan and all the other ones are like way up North by like Traverse. And, um, I think, you know, Jackson has a lot of wonderful attributes when it comes to the outdoor spaces. Cause, um, if you look at how many state parks there are, like big ones, like Waterloo state rec area in the lower peninsula, there's not a lot of them in South, Southeast Michigan. I think that's that's the biggest one and the closest one nearby. It makes sense because we have the biggest population around here, mm-hmm. uh, Southeast Michigan. But um, most of our public lands in Michigan, which I think we have like 12% maybe, like most of that is up in the UP. Yeah. And so it's only like 2% of it's down in the lower peninsula. So, so we're really in a, you know, it's a, it's a nice kind of Goldilocks place, especially for me because it's, on the way home from work, you know, yeah. it's like right on the yeah. way. Yep. So, well, Dr. Lazaro, thank you. Sure. You yeah. know, for joining us today, kind of talking about some hunter safety pieces, you know, yeah. we want everybody to stay safe when they go hunting this season. And then also obviously enjoy the outdoors though. We want them going outside and enjoying yeah. the weather. Absolutely. The parks and everything nearby. So we yeah, appreciate you advantage. coming on. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. It's wonderful. Absolutely. Well, um, if you want more of these kind of podcasts, you can always visit henryford.com slash podcasts. And, um, Find them there and listen on, uh, what is it? iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Facebook. Anywhere you can find podcasts, Dave. Anywhere. All right. We'll see you later.